Well, good morning, church. Good morning. So glad you decided to join us for worship this morning. My name is Steve Putka. I serve as pastor here. And on behalf of the entire congregation, we'd like to welcome our special guest, Illuminati. Uh, so let's, there we go. So glad that y'all are here for folks who don't, did not uh, anticipate their arrival. The first thing I want to say is it's just great to have a choir back in this space for worship. Um, glad you are here. The congregation had a choir for years and years and years. And like a lot of churches during the pandemic, of course, things kind of timed out. And this is one of the few times since then that we've had a choir here. Glad that you are here. For people not familiar, Illuminati, how many years now have you all been? Oh, I put you on the spot. 2008. Began about in 2008. And Illuminati is the sacred music choir for the Columbus Gay Men's Chorus. So uh, they've traveled quite a way uh, to be here with us. I know y'all came on a bus, and I'm really, really pleased that you're here. Uh, I'll take a moment of privilege. Got uh, knowing uh, Matt from uh, uh, Cardinal Corral, correct? Yeah. And we go back some years, and then I have a, a person also that I uh, had been connected to before his retirement uh, being United Methodist clergy. So, so glad to have you here. We look forward to hear you sing. I have a few announcements that I'd like to share before we uh, turn things over to Marty, who I think has a few additional announcements beyond that. Uh, but the first thing I want to mention is we are doing a book study on the book by Dr. Jamar Tisby called The Color of Compromise. And for me, it was a very moving and revealing account of the compromises that the American, the bad compromises that the American church has made in relation to racism in the American church. So it's a, it's a very stirring book. I know that we're planning on doing some uh, uh, group discussion on this. And we have uh, books that are available for sale for $15. And you can grab those from the, uh, from the office. Is that correct, Larry? Right. There's a sign-up sheet for book studies in the office. Okay, wonderful. And a sign-up uh, sheet for book studies as well. So that would be one thing. The second thing I'd like to bring up Speaking of Dr. Jamar Tisby, uh, he uh, was featured in a documentary called God and Country. People may not be familiar with this documentary, but it's a very revealing uh, documentary about the dangers of Christian nationalism and where we're moving as a nation. And they really begin to unpack that in God and Country. So we have decided to rent out the Neon Theater on uh, April 30th, which is a Tuesday night, and the movie will be shown at 7.30. Tickets are available for 12.50, and they're available now. Larry, who should we talk with about getting tickets? Um, there is a sign-up sheet in uh, Madonna Hallway. The, the group price is $10. Okay, so our price will be $10, That's because right. we'll be... Thank you. And the Madonna hallway, if you go out to the main kind of the center there, it's that long hallway that leads to the parking lot that's visible from Salem. So that's where the Madonna hallway is, and that's where the sign-up sheet will be. Uh, you might be hearing Dr. Tisby, Dr. Tisby. Part of that is because he will be coming to visit us. He's the author of uh, The Color of Compromise and is also featured in this documentary. Unfortunately, we ran into the, um, the agent's schedule versus Jamar's personal schedule. And we thought that he was going to be available to come in and visit in May. That's what all this is building to. But uh, we are looking at another date, likely in September. But we'll keep people informed of that. We're looking forward to having him as a, a guest speaker or as a guest preacher for worship, but also a main uh, lecture in the afternoon. And we're expecting that a number of faith leaders and community leaders in the city of Dayton will be here uh, to listen to what he has to say about the, the dangers specifically of white Christian nationalism and how Christians of good conscience need to be aware of what's happening and perhaps pre, pre, uh, provide an alternative voice in the way that we understand our faith. So uh, those are, I believe, all the announcements that I have, unless I was forgetting one, Marty? No. Okay, it's on to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, as you know, when you come to visit, if you have any prayers or requests, anybody, visitors, you can send them in to Grace if you have some prayers, but also send us some of your joys because I'm sure the prayer group would like to hear your joys also and celebrate with you. For those that are visiting, we have a yellow card that you can fill out and we will send you information about what is going on in Grace. Also, men meet this coming April 16th down in, uh, well, I guess it's near Yankee. They have it at the Pancake House. And also the women meet this week, April 18th at the Breakfast Club. And remember, Joe is having a concert here, April 21st at two o'clock in the afternoon. That is our organist, and that will be a delightful event. Marty? Yes. The women are at Panera. The women are at Panera, down on Shoop. On Far Hills. Well, yeah, kinda, yeah, Far Hills. So they gather together and have lively conversations. Also, there is a book study that we do and discuss several books in the morning here, and it can be a very lively discussion sometimes. But, um, and sometimes we have to have a good laugh, and I'm gonna share you one of those that we had today. Shortly after tying the knot, a young married couple started arguing over who should make the coffee in the morning. Being a good Christian woman, the wife went to the scriptures for her answer. She said the Bible specifically states that men should be the ones to make coffee. <laughs> Puzzled, the husband asked her, where in the Bible does it say that? That very confidently, the wife opened up her Bible and said, there it is, Hebrews. <laughs> So you can go home and debate who's going to make the coffee. Thank you.
If you would please stand for the call to worship. We gather this morning remembering the resurrection. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The tomb was empty and Jesus Christ appeared. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Jesus Christ returned, forgiving all harm and welcoming all to a life of discipleship. The risen Christ invites us to follow his path. Christ is risen. Our opening hymn is 398. Please join me in the community prayer. God of hope, we see your love poured out for us in all the world. Make us more like you. Teach us to live together as one community, learning from Jesus so your love is known among all the peoples. Help us to truly hear your call. Help us also to accept your forgiveness. Amen. And if the ushers would come forward in just a moment so that we may give our offerings back to the Lord.
Please be seated. I'd like to invite us all to come to prayer, shall we? Holy Creator, we give you thanks. We can be so grateful for all that you have given us. In a Trinitarian way, we can look at your goodness and thank you for the beauty of the creation that you have given us. Grass growing way too quickly out there, the beautiful spring flowers and the warmer temperatures, and not just the easily noticed beauty of nature, but also the beauty of the human spirit, the beauty of people that we have had the pleasure to love and to be loved by. Lord, your creation is wonderful and beautiful, and we thank you for it. We would ask your forgiveness upon us for ways that we have mistreated your good gift. Bless us with your Holy Spirit and with awareness and the strength to choose uh, ways that will help to care for the great gift that you have given us in the creation. Holy Creator, we thank you for the presence of Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, as the Gospel of John said, and pitched a tent with us, came to abide with us, live with us, to teach us, to show us a path that leads to abundant life even to suffer and die. Lord, we thank you for the glory and the wonder of the resurrection, this season that we celebrate, this resurrection season. Help us to be aware and to be open to the new life that you give us. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that leads us in every good thing. We thank you for the gifts of your Spirit, like wisdom, understanding, giving good counsel, courage, fortitude, knowledge, living right in the way that God would have us live, and being in awe before you, respectful and desiring to follow your ways. Holy God, you are the giver of all good things. And in the midst of all that grace and wonder, we also recognize that there is brokenness in this world, that there's hurting, Lord, we lift up all kinds of people who experience brokenness of body, mind, and spirit. We lift up people who are physically ill. We lift up folks that are being cared for in hospitals and rehab centers and nursing care facilities. We lift up people dealing with in, uh, illnesses, including cancer. Lord, we'd ask your blessing upon all those in this congregation and beyond who are in need of a physical healing. Lord, we would ask your blessing upon all those uh, that are dealing with emotional uh, damage, whether it's trauma or it's grieving or just difficulties, uh, live in the day-to-day. -day. Lord, help us to be a blessing to these folks. And finally, Holy God, we would ask for blessing uh, upon people who are in need of spiritual healing. Particularly, Holy God, we uh, lift up those who have not received true hospitality from our churches. Lord, uh, help us to be a blessing uh, to folks. Help us to show hospitality. Help us to welcome everyone, for grace is for everyone. Lord, guide us that we would be um, your leaders in the way that you would have us lead in this world. And that is by being a servant to all, just as Jesus taught us by washing feet. Lord, we ask your blessing upon this congregation. Help us to continue to blossom. Help us to continue to grow. And help us to continue to reach out and provide care in this world through all the various ministries of this congregation. We ask your blessing upon all the people who have been touched by these ministries. Bless and strengthen them as well. And now we pray our Lord's Prayer in the way that uh, we have uh, written in the bulletin. Praying, Father, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who has wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from the last chapter of John. And over the last couple of weeks, we have heard where Jesus met with the disciples after he was raised from the dead in an upper room or in a room, one of the first occasion. And then last week we heard about Thomas and how he had doubted. But, but, but today's a fish story. And in honor of a fish story, I'm wearing my dad's fishing shirt. I grew up in Fort Lauderdale. One grandpa, grandfather was in Montgomery, Alabama. He was a blacksmith. My grandfather in Lauderdale was a, um, he delivered gas and my dad went along with him. And whenever they had the opportunity, they would go fishing. And sometimes it was, I was, came along with them. I got, I got seasick on Lake Okeechobee. That's not a really place where you get seasick a lot, but, but I managed it. Fish stories. We've, we've heard them. We've told them. They didn't really exaggerate what they did. The exaggeration, I, which was, I was hoping, was they kept talking about water moccasins that they'd fish with and swam with and all that stuff, but that's from my imagination. But Jesus, after all of that, he came to met with the disciples and again in Tiberias. They were gathered together, seven of them. Simon Peter, um, Thomas, called the twin, and um, Nathaniel, um, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. And Peter said, I'm going fishing. They said, you know what, we're going to go with you. So they all got in the boat, went out all night, caught absolutely nothing. Well, early in the morning, Jesus was standing along the shore, but nobody recognized him. And he yelled out, children, you haven't caught any fish, have you? And they go, nope. He said, throw your net out on the right side of the ship, right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And so they did. They threw their net out on the right side, and suddenly they couldn't pull the net in. There were so many fish. That disciple that Jesus loved, that's a good one to figure out. (laughs) He says, it is the Lord. Simon Peter, when he heard that, he grabbed his clothes because he was naked and jumped in the water, swam to shore. The rest of them, they brought the boat in and drug the net behind them. And they weren't very far, 100 yards offshore. When they got to the shore, there was a charcoal fire with some fish and some bread on it. And Jesus said, Bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter, ever the exuberant one, goes back to the boat, jumps in, pulls the net in, and though there were were 153 fish in there, he pulls it in, but the net doesn't break. Gets out, and Jesus says, come have breakfast with me. I've had breakfast on the beach in Fort Lauderdale. We didn't have fish, we had scrambled eggs. Part of beach sand in your scrambled eggs is not fun. But Jesus took the fish and broke it and passed it out. Took the bread, broke it and passed it out. None of the disciples dared ask, who was this guy on the shore? Because they all knew it was Jesus. And this was the third time that Jesus revealed himself to his disciples after he was resurrected. The word of God for the people of God. And tell your own fish stories.
Would you pray with me, please? Holy Creator, we thank you for the blessing of your word. And we would ask through its, in, through its telling and through its interpretation today that you would have for us just exactly the message we need for this day. A message to encourage us and also a message to challenge us. We pray these things together in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Just kind of as a show of hands, did anybody notice there was kind of a major astronomical thing that happened this past week? Maybe? Now, I saw the eclipse, had a great time, actually took a little vacation time to get to a nice spot and take a look at it. I'm curious, did you girls see the eclipse? Did you see it? Did you have the special glasses or did you do the box? You had the glasses? Oh yeah, anybody else have the glasses? That was pretty cool. Well, what I learned uh, about how this eclipse thing functions, all the planets and the sun is spinning and the moon and all that other kind of, there's a lot of motion, but really mostly what happened was the sun was pretty much stable, but the moon moved in, right? And it blocked out the sun. It was a total eclipse. I don't know about you, but I did feel it getting cooler. Did anybody feel it getting cooler? Absolutely. It got so dark where we were that the street lights actually came on. Did that happen for anybody else? Yeah. A very, very cool thing. And in our, uh, where we were staying, there was kind of like a neighborhood party going on next door, and somebody actually prepared an eclipse soundtrack, huh? I played a little Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. And then I heard it, the theme song for the eclipse. <laughs> Turn around. <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to go along with it. Thank you, Matt. He did that on the fly, by the way. I talked to him like three minutes before worship started, and he said, I think I got it. Total eclipse of the heart. I had to look it up because I've sung the song. By the way, a little bit of trivia on that song. It was originally written for meatloaf. Did you know that? Yeah, right? If you think about it, it really sounds like a meatloaf song. If you know that Jim Steinman, who was like the producer on the Bad Out of Hell album, he wrote all this stuff for meatloaf, and then they went their separate ways. So he started chipping it off to different musicians. Yeah, but can't you just, this has nothing to do with Jesus, okay? <laughs> but can't you just imagine meatloaf singing that? Anyhow, now, M Marty was able to get a little uh, corny, so I'm going to give a little kind of corniness here. Feel free to groan. I would describe the experience that Peter had as a little bit of a total eclipse of the heart. Uh, maybe? Let me, okay, all right. You guys are too polite. You don't know me well. I, I, I expected huge groans in, like in unison coming from for that kind of segue. But really, if you think about Peter and what Peter experienced, he had a really, really rough couple of days. I think at the point that uh, we pick up the story uh, and what David Larson shared, oh, no, I'm sorry, it was Frank Hollingsworth who shared it. Thank you, Frank, for uh, telling that scripture. What happened was, um, Peter was probably, I had to imagine, at his lowest point, okay? Because if you remember what happened, and we've been hearing stories about Peter as we've gone through, uh, Peter comes in for the Last Supper, right? And I'm pulling from different Gospels as I'm kind of meshing this together. Some people think that's not kosher, I'm good with it. But what happens is, a little Jewish pun there, um, <laughs> What happens is, they're, they're, Jesus takes the form of a servant, right? And he begins to wash people's feet. And Peter being the kind of the loud guy, the, he's the extrovert in the room all the time, speak first and then think later. I see we have some tapping. We're, we're outing the extroverts right now. But what happened was, Peter says, oh, if, you're, if the only way to have life in you is to wash uh, my feet, not just don't wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my head. I'm all in, Jesus, right? And then Jesus goes a little bit further in the meal and he says, One of y'all is going to betray me. That was Southern Jesus. He said, One of y'all is going to betray me. And, and Peter says to the effect, something like, Well, everybody else will walk, but not me. Not me. 
I'm the one you can count on. I'm the rock, right? And on this rock, you're going to build a church. I am the stable one. I'm going to stand firm. All these other people, they might turn aside, but certainly not me, Jesus. And Jesus says, not so fast. You're going to betray me before the sun comes up and you hear the cock crowing. And sure enough, it happens, right? That was even after, in the garden, when they were going to arrest Jesus, Peter pulls out a sword and whacks off some guy's ear. He's all ready to get all, you know, military and violent. But then when Jesus, isn't that just a Jesus thing? He heals the ear of the guy that had the, had the ear cut off by Peter. And Peter doesn't have any weapons anymore. Peter's ready to deal with a sword and defend him that way. But how do you deal peacefully with what's going on? He takes off and leaves only to deny him later. I think Peter is so disconsolate, so upset, he winds up going back to fishing. You ever think about that? He's going back to the old familiar. He's going back to what he knows. And he's still a leader. I love that he says, hey, uh, I'm going fishing. They're like, we'll go with you, Peter, right? He's their leader, right? So he comes along, and he's in the boat, and he sees Jesus. And Jesus gives Peter a do-over. The same way that he called him to begin with, being in the boat. And by the way, Peter's string of bad luck does not just extend to his relationship with Jesus. Peter's like, well, at least I know fishing. I can always go back to that. And all night, he skunked, right? I mean, this poor guy. But Jesus calls to him and invites him to come. And he's so excited. He's just got his loincloth on or whatever, throws on his clothes again and tromps all the way over. The other guys maybe had a little more sense and they stayed nice and dry as they brought the boat in. But Peter's so excited. And the total eclipse of the heart thing is Jesus hadn't moved in a sense. He was always there for Peter. But like me, Peter's stuff got in the way. Peter's stuff gets in the way. I had to imagine that Peter was feeling really, really low, right? We hear the story as Christians quite often that we don't realize what a blow it is. Can you imagine uh, an actual brother or maybe a spouse denying that you even knew them? What do you think that would do to your relationship? Can you imagine the pain and even the shame you might feel for saying or doing something like that, especially after your big mouth went off about how faithful you were and you'd never forget this person, right? I think Peter's stuff interfered. And maybe he had even begun to forget the kind of forgiveness that Jesus offers. And what happened, it, first of all, it was another thing when he, he approached him and he says, Simon. He doesn't call him the rock, did you notice? He calls him Simon. He says, do you love me? You know, and three times he gives him the opportunity to say, yes, Lord, I love you. And I think Peter begins to realize that he is forgiven by Jesus, that he is freed. And see, that's the thing about Jesus. I used to, my theology, I used to think, well, I do bad things, and therefore God begins to hate me. And that's not the way it goes. When, when I, we can use the old language, sin, or when I move into a brokenness, when I live a life that doesn't lead to love and to abundant life, when I, when I do that kind of stuff, I can create a barrier between me and God. But all I really need to do is to ask God's forgiveness. God is waiting like that sun behind the moon, right? And if together, God and I, you and God, can move that moon out of the way, we can see the sun shining again because it was there all along, right? It's not that God stops loving us. It's often our own stuff that interferes with a close and deep and real relationship with God. That do-over, let uh, Peter move the moon and move on. 
Now, last week, the sermon title was The Uprising of Fellowship, and we talked about this uprising that happened, not in a violent way, but in a very nonviolent way, after the resurrection of Jesus. There was this thing that happened, and people began to gather in rooms and continued to gather together in community. But now we see this uprising of discipleship, where even one who completely denied that he knew Jesus was being invited back into relationship. He said, come and follow me, right? So Peter begins to follow again. He goes back to being the rock, right? Discipleship, come and follow. It's an important thing. I believe that this congregation uh, is a congregation of fellowship. I believe that this gathered congregation is a congregation that is equipped for discipling our community and already has working in that way, but can really grow in that regard. But I want to share a wonderful thing with you. Last week, we had some Eclipse viewers right here in Dayton, Ohio. Some of you may have met them. Their names were Mike and Kathy. They were staying at a and b within walking distance. And uh, I didn't know this, but Michael writes a blog. And he sent a message along to the church saying, hey, wanted to let you know that I included Grace in my blog. Thought you might want to read it. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read what he wrote about this congregation. Because I think we need to hear it. I know my tendency as pastor is encouraging us to take that hill or do the next thing, very doing-oriented, but it's important also to affirm what we're doing well as a congregation. So I'm going to read what Michael had to say about us. Maybe you can see yourself in here. He writes, Kathy and I were in Dayton on Saturday, April 6th. We stayed at a B&B in the Dayton View Historic District. While looking for our B&B, we saw Grace UMC, a large, imposing gray stone building on the hill. We decided to attend the next morning for worship. Church had good info on its website, so we knew when worship began. We were walking to the church a couple of blocks away and trying to figure out where to enter. It was not quite obvious. <laughs> we can work on that. Better signage, right, folks? Okay. A car pulled up, and a woman rolled down the window and asked if we were looking for the entrance. We said yes, and she told us how to get there. Even better, she drove into the parking area and waited for us. She introduced herself, Roberta, <laughs> and escorted us into the building. She asked about us and told us some about the church. She walked us through the historic building, introduced us to people in the hallways and rooms, including the pastor, and then went with us to the sanctuary. She sat with us and introduced us to people around us. The building itself is incredibly beautiful, blah, 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 you know what it looks like. The people were dressed comfortably, <laughs> which was good for us. We were wearing jeans and pullover shirts, some wore coat and ties, dresses, suits, and others were in jeans and t-shirts. Didn't seem to matter to anyone. We noticed immediately that it was not only a multicultural congregation, but also people from across the economic spectrum. That does not happen by accident or chance. That must be worked on. Kathy mentioned that to Roberta, and she said, well, grace is for everyone. We heard that phrase a few times. I do not know if it is their official motto or mission statement or logo, but everyone seemed to know it. And when they said it, it wasn't as if they were trying to sell you a product, like Ace is the place with the helpful hardware, folks. <laughs> it was more like, this is who we are. I mentioned to one person how much the church was involved in the community, and she said, yes. Grace is for everyone. I talked to the bus driver in the parking lot who drove to the VA home and the homeless shelters to pick people up and thanked him for what he did. He said, sort of off the cuff, well, grace is for everyone. I think that was you, Rex. <laughs> the service was traditional. The music was from the hymnal. Words of the hymns and the common prayers were on the large screen, as well as protection of whoever was speaking or projection of whoever was leading or speaking. Music was very good, and I particularly liked when the musician was playing the organ for the prelude. The projectionist showed us both, both hands on the keys and his feet on the pedals in a split screen. Special music included a violin solo and a, voice, uh, and a vocal of Lord of the Dance, both well done. 
Uh, I believe that would be, that was Lois, and of course the folks up in the booth, uh, the pastor, blah, 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 we know. Uh, ah, the scripture, rather than being read, was told by one of the laity. Turns out it was David, Roberta's husband. The woman sitting behind us told us that they had been doing this for a while and she loved it. David told the story almost word for word from the Gospels, not his version of it, but what it said. He acted out a little of it for emphasis. It was the story of Thomas after the resurrection. He did a great job of making it real. The second page is much shorter. But. Pastor's sermon was good, applicable down to earth. He talked about blah, blah, blah. He invited everybody to take part, even if you doubted, in the communion. They used those little individual hermetically sealed cups with grape juice on one side and a small cracker on the other. These were passed out to the congregation. The pastor said that he used to hate those things, but had come to accept that for a while this was the best that we could do. Personally, I don't like those cups, but as I looked around the congregation, I saw several people wearing masks, and I realized that this was one way of making them feel comfortable and welcome, and that trumps my own preference any day. I noticed for the most part the liturgy had inclusive language, not exclusively, but it was noticeable to me. It was done in a way that did not sound forced, but natural. At the end of the service, the woman behind us leaned forward and said, you may want to go ahead and leave, and that's okay, but most of us sit quietly through the postlude, thinking about how we will live out what we've heard for the next week. Kathy and I sat, thought, and prayed. After the service, they were having a meeting to talk about becoming a reconciling congregation. So Kathy and I left, went to the balcony to see the beautiful architecture from above, and walk back to the B&B. &B. Pastor Steve was fairly new there, came in, last, in July of last year. He obviously loves the people and is leading them in some great ways, but he also has some wonderful people in the congregation who have caught the vision of grace, both the church and the theological concept for being for everyone. If I lived in Dayton, I would be back and would be part of the congregation if they would have me. Of course, they would have to, because grace is for everyone. <laughs> Final paragraph. The sanctuary would probably seat 700, and I'm estimating that there were, uh, well, they, they, they guessed high. They estimated about 175 people there. A few people told us of the days years ago when it was filled with families and children and all kinds of things were happening. They pointed with pride to the wonderful building they have. And this is key, so listen up. But the wonderful thing was not the building. It was the people. As we left, I thought, the glory days are not behind them. They are ahead. After all, grace is for everyone. I thought about just printing that in the bulletin, but I really wanted to read it. For starters, because we have folks online and I wanted to you know, kind of share with our online group so you could hear it. But it also comes to play in this idea of an uprising of discipleship. And this idea of fellowship and discipleship are interrelated, right? It's when you set the table, when you make it clear that grace is for everyone, when you even make it specific and let people know, yes, everyone really does mean everyone. And if you come inside, you'll see that that's the case. When we do that and we provide that hospitality to everyone, that's when we can move on to discipleship. When we show with our lives and the way that we welcome others that we have, we're eager to bring folks in, that's when we're best able to say, we are this kind of community because of Jesus. It's because we follow Jesus that we love all and welcome all. It's because we love Jesus that we invite you to follow on this path, this amazing path of, path of grace. And we use that church word all the time, but grace is when God gives you something amazing that you don't deserve and you can't earn, right? Right? And we find that when we really understand what grace is all about, 
and the amazing forgiveness that we're offered, that God will move the moon for us so that we could feel the sun again on our face. When we come to that conclusion and really understand how deeply we are loved by God, how can we not share that with other people? How can we not invite people to come and learn about this loving God who loves us all deeply? Friends, I believe the future is bright for grace because I see a congregation who is welcoming, a group who is loving, a group who's eager to tell people about Jesus and help them learn what it means to be within a community where all are genuinely welcomed. Folks, this DNA does not exist in every church. Can I hear an amen? I'm not trying to put down other churches because I hope that they get there, but I believe that our congregation is way further along than most. All we need to do is invite them to come and see. Do we love you, Jesus? You know very well we do. Can we pray together, please? Holy Creator, we thank you for people like Peter that demonstrate that we can really, really mess up bad and that you still will welcome us back. Holy God, we thank you for people like Michael and Kathy, Michael writing this blog, that would remind us that we are a community that believes that grace is for everyone. Holy God, help us to continue to maintain and demonstrate that welcome in all kinds of ways so that we might continue to grow and continue to disciple people in our community that they would be transformed by your love. We pray these things together. In the strong name of Jesus, and all of God's people say, amen. amen. As we uh, get ready to close our worship service together this morning, we're going to sing together. It's hymn number 344, and in English, the title is, Lord, You Have Come to the Lake Shore. And uh, you will see that the, the verses are in English, or in Spanish, and then in English. So I'm going to sing the Spanish for verse 1. Anybody who is feeling adventurous or is a Spanish speaker is welcome to join me. And then we will sing verse one in English and then we'll do verse two in Spanish the same way and then verse two in English, all right? So if you would stand with me and join in uh, body or spirit and we will sing together however many languages you like. <laughs> Oh, Lord, yeah. 
of Illuminati, I think you uh, can gauge the response of this congregation. We're so grateful to God for your music that you have shared with us today. You uh, really have, um, have touched me in your, in your music, and boy, oh boy, we hope you're willing to come back sometime. Uh, <laughs> Before we move to our postlude, uh, they have already sung a benediction, but it is my tradition to remind people, um, know this, uh, you do not go alone. God is with, us, with you, inviting you to serve like little reflecting mirrors, right? Shining God's light into those shadowy kind of places in this world. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be the light. As we leave this place, know that we do not go alone. 
May the blessing of Almighty God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may it be upon us now, and remain with us forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let's give our attention to the postlude and reflect on how you might be able to share God's love in this world. apologize for a little snafu. Uh, we had provided box lunches for Illuminati, but we understand that you actually have reservations at a place to eat a little bit later. So I wanted to let you know that the meals that we had prepared for you instead will travel with our bus over to the women's shelter here in Dayton, and we'll make sure that those are put to good use. So uh, this concludes our worship service. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>